It is a serious week. Today, people of Iowa will caucus to decide who might the next president be, at the very least, who will be the first frontrunner with votes in hand and delegates in hand in the Democratic primary to be president of these United States. We'll have a State of the Union this week, and this week we'll have a final decision almost certainly on what the vote count will be for the impeachment trial of the president of the United States. It's a serious week. It's a big week. And because it's a serious week, I'm wearing a coat and tie today. I don't wear a coat and tie very often, but it is a coat and tie week. My name is Jefferson Smith. I'm sitting in for Tom Hartman. I am honored to do so. And thank you so much for being with us. The call-in line will give you in a moment. And in a moment, I want to play a clip from Lamar Alexander. Lamar Alexander made the case for Donald Trump to be president. Now, he was interviewed by Chuck Todd, and the interview went viral. Lots of people saw it. And they saw it because of the first portion In the first portion where Chuck Todd said, well, you know, why does the president do this kind of stuff? He said, well, maybe the president doesn't know the right thing to do. And Chuck Todd said, when is he going to learn? At what point should we, in fact, expect that he's the president of the United States? He should know how to be president of the United States. The job of president is to be the president and to know how to do the job and know how to be the president. And that part, that little part, was the focus of much gnashing of teeth over the Internet weekend. There's another part of that same short clip that I think is vastly more important, that I think explains the vote count in the U.S. Senate on whether or not evidence should be allowed in a trial. I'll say that again. The vote count on whether evidence should be allowed in a trial. For those of us who went to law school, trials are about evidence. If you have something that doesn't have evidence, that's an appeal. If you have something that doesn't have evidence, that might be a judge's ruling. That might be a summary judgment. But if you have a trial, the reason it's a trial is you take evidence. And the finder of fact then evaluates that evidence. Lamar Alexander, I'm not going to say he said the inside part out loud. I think it's also the out loud part. But he made the case for Donald Trump to be president of the United States. And what I want to hear from you about is to make sure that we know how to respond to that. What is the counter-argument? I'll welcome your counter-arguments. And I also might make a couple of my own. It is a big week today. It is a serious week. It is my coat and tie day because it's a serious day and a serious week. Another significant question, what should we be watching for in Iowa? There's going to be a different dynamic after today. Since 2015, when Bernie Sanders surprised some people by announcing a candidacy for president, and many people greeted that with thankfulness that there would at least be a contested Democratic primary. The Hillary Clinton, who was announced as the presumptive nominee, would have a challenge from the left, and that would spark discussion. Many people didn't think that that discussion would yield Many votes for someone other than presumptive nominee Hillary Clinton. But at least there would be a discussion. U.S. senators like my U.S. senator, Senator Jeff Merkley, thought that would be good. Eventually even endorsed Bernie Sanders. Well, Bernie Sanders ended up getting a lot more votes than anybody thought. But at no point did it become clear or even assumed that he was the front runner, the fact that he would be the president. He did not become the nominee and people moved on. And he was in his mid-70s, so I think a lot of people thought, well, he probably won't run again. He did run again. And then there was another presumptive nominee, Joe Biden. And the candidate that Bernie Sanders had urged to run in 2016, Elizabeth Warren, who didn't run in 2016, did run. 
And again, Bernie Sanders would be in the, you know, second to third position, receiving some degree of discussion, attention certainly, but not the kind of attention one receives as a presumptive nominee, as the likely front runner to be the Democratic standard bearer to be president of these United States. If the most recent polls are correct, and Bernie Sanders is up, let's say, seven points in Iowa, and he does, in fact, come in first place, one might say not win. You might not win Iowa. You don't get all the delegates. Those are apportioned proportionately. And almost certainly no one who is running will get a majority of those delegates. But let's say he gets first place in Iowa. It will become clear that Bernie Sanders is the front runner to be the Democratic nominee for the president of these United States. And I'd have to say that there aren't, when, when John Kerry was running for president and he surprised some folks in Iowa a little bit better, and part of the reason was he had tapped into a lot of on the ground folks who could caucus well. I don't think there is as clear a rationale, a reason to think that Bernie will underperform in Iowa because he's got such a strong ground game because he built something so strong in 2016 and he's built it stronger in 2020. If he becomes the front runner, how does that change the dynamic? I don't mean, does that mean you change who you want for president? I don't mean, do we pound the table harder for Bernie Sanders? Do we pound the table harder for Elizabeth Warren? Do we pound the table harder for Amy Klobuchar or somebody else? That's not what I mean. But how does it change the dynamic? What do we start evaluating differently tomorrow than we've been evaluating for the first part of this year, for last year, and frankly, the last five years? I think that's a dynamic that will change. Another thing we we'll want to cover this week, the president's State of the Union. The president will stand up as an impeached president and give us his constitutionally mandated address about how the country is doing. What do we expect from that? What do we want to be prepared for? How should the response focus? These are serious times. We like to make fun of the President of the United States. A habit very often of the liberal constabulary is to poke fun at the dum-dum, whether that dum-dum was Hitler or that dum-dum was Reagan or that dum-dum was Bush or that dum-dum is Trump. But the dum-dum critique doesn't always go very far because these are serious matters. And while we might poke fun from time to time and might even have some of it, these are serious matters. It is a serious week. And how should we be attending to those serious matters of what a president and what a country should do?